everyone, and welcome to another episode of Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill. Today, you're in for a real treat for multiple reasons. One is in this post-pandemic era, we have more complex chronic illness than ever before and more sequelae of this virus called COVID. And today, we're going to dive deep with one of the world's leading experts. Um, If you listen to us on iTunes, uh, Spotify, YouTube, please stop and leave a review. And uh, there's many more episodes that you can find there. But today, without further ado, I want to introduce my guest, Dr. Bruce Patterson. Dr. Bruce Patterson, medical doctor, received his undergraduate degree in training in molecular biology from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He then received his MD at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, followed by a residency in pathology. During During the early stages of the AIDS epidemic, Dr. Patterson began investigating cellular reservoirs of HIV using molecular and in situ cell-based technology patented in his laboratory and used today around the world. He would determine that enough HIV virus was present in infected individuals to account for the massive destruction of the immune system. This paradigm altering the work, I'm sorry, this paradigm altering work was published in Science in 1993 and featured in the Science Scientific America, Rolling Stone, and on the Discovery Channel. Dr. Patterson has authored over 150 manuscripts and book chapters focusing on single cell biology and diagnostics. He was formerly associate professor professor of pathology and infectious disease and director of virology at Stanford University. He currently serves as CEO and founder of Incel DX Incorporated, a growth stage company that has translated his research discoveries into state-of-the-art single cell diagnostics in cancer, immuno-oncology, and infectious diseases, especially our topic of today, COVID. Welcome, Dr. Patterson. That is quite a history, and I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Dr. Jill. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So what I always like to start, um, and I mentioned this before we got on, is you have quite the journey. And it's interesting because you at Northwestern, I was at Loyola, so we were both in Chicago for some time during residency and training. Um, But this journey through all that you've been through, tell us, first of all, how did you get into medicine? And then what was your path into all the scientific discoveries that you made through the years with HIV? I mean, really, it's really a family, family affair. We, um, my grandfather and my aunt are, are both um, PhD scientists, and uh, my aunt was a classical virologist uh, from the 60s and 70s. So, you know, back in the days where we didn't have all this great molecular um, biology and you had to grow the viruses on, on chick embryos, you know, that was her thing. And then, uh, you know, I think I was about 17 or 18, and I went to her lab and she showed me an electron microscope with uh, with magnified a uh, virus a hundred thousand times, and and I was sold. I'm like, this is this is what I want to do for the the rest of my life. And you know what's interesting is back then they called it the Norwalk agent, and it's actually the norovirus, which is our cruise ship virus. You know, which um, lands a few cruise ships in port uh, unexpectedly. So. You know that was that was the start of it, and then of course molecular biology was it in its infancy, and um, you know I just have been riding that molecular wave as it infiltrated medicine um, all that time. And the interesting thing was, you know, the AIDS uh, epidemic really pushed the envelope on um, molecular medicine and molecular diagnostics and and those te- techniques much like COVID, as, as we'll talk about, has really pushed the envelope on uh, um, new wave uh, immunology techniques and, and discoveries. Mm. Uh, what I love that because it's really been such a lifelong and you can tell because it really takes, I always uh, say that curiosity is a mark of genius, but it, you clearly had that way back at 14 or the first time you looked at the microscope. And it really takes that, especially in a new era of medicine with these complex and crazy viruses like COVID, you have to be curious and you have to think outside the box to get the answers that you've been coming up with. So then obviously I read a little bit in your bio about your work, but you made some massive discoveries with HIV. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because I think it's fascinating. Well, you know, when I first started in HIV, um, you know, there was this two different things. There was patients dying of these horrible uh, uh, immune deficiency syndromes, Kaposi sarcoma, and lymphomas, etc. Um, and then, of course, there was this virus. But putting together, it's the virus causing 
you know, uh, the, you know, causing AIDS was uh, the big question when I first started. And, you know, there was even very prominent scientists saying, well, you know what, HIV, HIV virus doesn't cause um, AIDS. So, you know, my training in, in, in molecular biology and, and pathology really was instrumental in saying, well, um, maybe we're just not finding it. Maybe we're missing it. And I think that was the big thing uh, that I was working on at the time was, um, hey, maybe maybe we can't find it. I'm going to try and do molecular biology in these single single cells of the body's body instead of you know fluids and et cetera, and try and find where the virus is hiding. Um, and we were able to do that, and uh, again able to quantify that, which allowed. A lot of the early work in um, antiretrovirals, including, you know, I was just talking the other day about, you know, uh, my involvement when they're developing the protease inhibitors and figuring out that, you know, it really, it took people who had CD4 counts of single digits, seven, you know, or 10 and, uh, you know, a few uh, months of therapy and they're back up in the hundreds. So it was... Um, it's one of those moments that you never forget. Uh, you look back and say, "Wow, that was that really changed the course of everything." As as you know, HIV infected individuals are living you know healthy, long lives now and still have it, but you know we've been really effective at treating it with uh, drug therapy. Amazing that you have that background, and then again, now we're in this new era where we really need to think outside the box because. What is your, what's the big overview? COVID is such a different thing than we've encountered before. So do you want to frame it for, I told you before, we have a lot of physicians and people interested, but I know a lot of uh, patients, clients, give us a framework for this virus and why is it so different from things that we've experienced in the past? You know, it was interesting. Um, you know, it's different, but again, it's not in some ways. And, you know, I was in China in January of 2020 um, actually, uh, doing, uh, we had developed a new t immune profiling test with over 150 different, um, biomarkers, both cell-based and, and, and plasma-based for, um, looking at, um, CAR T therapy and cancer. And we were in China talking to a company over there and I was in, in Shanghai. Someone said, well, there's this, I was supposed to go to Wuhan, you know, the next day. To visit a, a, a another lab, um, another customer of Inceltiexis, and um, it was canceled because of this. There was this virus, and everyone was talking about it. I saw one of the really, really early papers uh, of this mm -hmm. virus and some of the lab results, and you know the 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 immune system was just you know uh, on fire, as we later learned, you know the cytokine storm, but. You know, it was uh, in immunology, you know, we have all these different arms of uh, of the immune system, adaptive in immune system, uh, humoral, cellular immunity, and hypersensitivity, et cetera. But this was clearly an innate immune response, which is basically what our body has when it hasn't seen uh, a uh, infectious agent before, you know, and it was heavy, heavily uh, macrophage burdened. Uh, meaning macrophages were playing a very significant role. And, and that was one of my major areas of uh, uh, research in, in HIV. So you had this massive immune uh, activation of macrophages, production of interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, which you know really um, were part of the initial pathogenesis in Q-COVID. And, and elements of that uh, still exist in, uh, in long COVID as well. Um, and are, you know, part of what we target um, with some of our diagnostics as well as uh, some of our therapeutics. But, and then the other thing in our first study in acute COVID found that, you know, CD8 T cells were just as low as the CD4 T cells were in HIV. Wow. So acute COVID patients with the alpha variant were supremely immunosuppressed. Yeah. And that is the nugget that people aren't considering as we're dealing with the post-acute sequelae of, of COVID is that people are, are immunosuppressed to varying degrees with acute COVID. What does that do? Well, 
It reactivates chronic herpes family viruses, EBV, CMV, HHV6, herpes simplex, etc. It also, uh, in patients who have either un undiagnosed or poorly treated Lyme, the bugs start to replicate yeah. again. And so, you know, um, and so what happens is all this is going on. And then all of a sudden we, we find, oh, there's this uh, post-infectious syndrome that has, you know, fatigue, brain fog, post-exertional malaise, joint muscle pain, you know, you know, the whole headaches, et cetera. Um, and that's all well and good as we, when we first described it in long COVID. Um, and, but the fact of the matter is all of those chronic inflammatory diseases have the same primary symptoms. So symptom-based diagnosis of long COVID is highly, highly nonspecific. It could be long COVID, it could be uh, long Lyme, as we call it, it can be ME-CFS, it could be fibromyalgia, it could be you know, long VAX. Yes. So mm -hmm. all of those have the same uh, primary symptoms. So the necessity for a diagnostic was critical. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact is, we have it. And nobody is saying we have a diagnostic for long COVID. It's absolutely absurd. We published it two and a half years ago, this signature for long COVID, and we developed a long hauler index. And it's still highly, highly sensitive, highly specific for long COVID. And now our latest paper, we can differentiate long COVID from Lyme, MECFS, uh, long vax, and, and, and fibromyalgia. And you know what? It is the most critical tool that we have. I hate to be long-winded, but... No, um, this is so relevant. I am get, so I would get excited because you're right. I mean, I deal with this complex chronic disease. So CFS, ME, long Lyme, long COVID. And for me, when I heard you really speak about in depth about the cytokine patterns, which we'll talk about and your lab test and how to differentiate. And I've been using your lab test for a while, but the more data that you guys bring out and the more patterns that you're showing us, it is a game changer for those of us dealing in this chronic world, because we can say this is much more likely to be your Lyme Borrelia reactivated, or it's more likely to be a true long COVID panel and it's treated differently. Absolutely. And, and another important aspect is, uh, is negative predictive value as mm -hmm. physicians, you know, and scientists, everyone loves to talk about sensitivity and specificity. And as I used to teach, you know, residents, um, both at Northwestern and Stanford, you know, I, I always said that sensitivity and specificity were after the fact statistics. Like you do a study, you look back and say, well, what was the sensitivity and specificity? But as a physician, you get a lab report mm -hmm. and you're looking at a number and a test result. What is going through your mind saying, what are the chances of that actually being positive? Or what are the chances of that actually being negative? What your mind is doing is actually positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Mm -hmm. And having a ne negative predictive value for long COVID of 98% uh, really says, we can say who doesn't have long COVID. And you know what? In the, in the days of you know, um, all this inflammation and you know, the major you know, uh, symptom being fatigue, yeah. it's almost yeah. important to say who doesn't have long COVID as it is to say who does have long COVID. Because as you say, you know, the treatment subtly different. We use, we, we had this other discovery which showed that all four of those chronic inflammatory conditions have, um, you know, vascular inflammation at their heart. Yes. Um, <laughs> but there's also subtle differences and subtle changes in this uh, drug combination that, you know, we just submitted, you know, to the FDA for uh, our clinical trial. Hey, everybody, I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life threatening illness, and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses 
So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Yeah. So gosh, there's so much I want to cover here. First of all, just for those listening, what you're talking about is innate immune system, which I've been dealing with for decades with mold and Lyme and complex chronic illness. And most of our patients have had some things like that, or know someone who has many of our physicians who listen, treat these conditions. So a lot of our listeners are going to be aware of that, but just to frame it, this is this arm of the immune system. Like you said, that's kind of the first activator or first responder that maybe doesn't have antibodies already made or um, those kinds of things. And it's typically cytokine driven, which is why we saw with just regular COVID it so much of the disease and the mortality was related to this. It's literally like the activation of our own systems and our own systems are killing us because they're in this cycle of activation that cytokines, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's an imperfect system and it's just trying to do something yeah. right. And, and uh, our, my colleague, uh, Joe Belanti always talks about you know, damaging immunity. And and the reality is, yes, some of these inflammatory products that are indeed trying to help uh, clear a virus or clear a bacterium or, or otherwise um, are damaging, are yeah. tissue damaging. Yeah. IL-6, TNF-alpha are two great examples. Um, and in our February paper, we showed that TNF-alpha is the major driver of fatigue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if anyone remembers, I mean, acute COVID was just uh, the fatigue and the uh, respiratory symptoms were just um, the major findings. But, you know, when you looked at the pathology more closely, it was blood vessel inflammation yes, yes. because what was happening is these activated monocyte macrophages, um, uh, non-classical monocytes, where we later found the S1 protein months after infection, um, they bind to blood vessels through the fractal kind, fractal kind receptor. And, you know, obviously the, one of the reasons we use statins is because they decrease fractal kind. Mm -hmm. So don't bind the pro-inflammatory uh, white blood cells to your blood vessels and cause endotheliitis. The other thing is uh, Maraviroc, the CCR5 antagonist, is elegant uh, in the immune system because it does two things. Number one, it restricts the migration of inflammatory cells all over your body, including through your blood-brain barrier. But what it also does is it repolarizes monocytes, macrophages away from that pro-inflammatory phenotype yeah. where it's making interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. So this, this drug combination we use is absolutely exquisite in terms of targeting the pathways that are underlying the symptoms uh, in long COVID, long Lyme, MECFS. And that's driven by the fact that the blood vessels are inflamed and dilated. Yes. Well, what do dilated blood vessels do? Headaches, yep. migraines, right. brain fog, tinnitus. Post-exertional <clears throat> fatigue, <laughs> right? All that, yeah. Hot and cold insensitivity. Yes. When I, 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 I can't tell you how many times on telemedicine I've seen a patient literally come on telemed with a blanket over their shoulders because they're so cold. And so temperature regulation is just completely thrown off. And that's my window into, <clears throat> into their blood vessels before I even look at their lab report. Oh, that makes so much sense. Like, um, so I've been, because of your research, I've been talking to patients that really COVID is like a disease of the endothelium, which is what you're saying, right? At the core, this macrophage activation. And let's talk just briefly, because one of the things you're testing in your panels as well is the retaining of the spike protein in these atypical macrophages, right? And that's part of the problem is they become activated and then they go. Do you want to talk just a little bit about what happens in the macrophages with that spike protein? So, you know, flashback to, you know, um, 2020, I'd be at this 158 biomarker um, panel. And, you know, we we used it on uh, acute COVID. And, you know, and we followed these patients 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And 90 days, you know, a lot of them got better. Um, they were home. But by no stretch of the imagination was their immune system the same. It was abnormal, but it was abnormal in a very different way than in acute COVID. And that's where we used machine learning and AI to say, okay, how is it different? Pattern. Why is it? And that's where we found this signature for, for long COVID. Um, and the long hauler index mm -hmm. is interleukin-2 plus interferon gamma divided by CCL4. Well, 
if you look at literature from the early 2000s, atherosclerosis, yeah. when non-classical monocytes bind to uh, blood vessels and and basically migrate into the um, um, blood vessels, uh, what's liberated is type 1 cytokines, interleukin-2, mm -hmm. interferon gamma, which just happens to be the numerator of our long hauler index, which was found by machine learning and AI 20 some years later. Wow. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And then you also mentioned, I've heard you speak multiple times about this triad of the vascular inflammation with the SCD40L, the CCL5, Rontes, and then the VEGF, is that the three? Can you tell me about those and what the pattern you've seen with that triad? So that was very helpful because obviously the first protein uh, of the thrombotic pathway and blood vessels is SCD40L. CCL5 and so that's VEGF. Like the instigator. That's like, you know, the macrophages have activated the endothelium if that is elevated. And is that, you see the timeline as well, see that up first, and then the rest of them follow over time? Well, usually by the time the patients come to us, they've had, you know, long COVID for yeah. three months or 18 months. Or I just had a patient, um, she had it for three years. Um, and yeah, it was uh, an unbelievable telemed session. Uh, a couple of days ago that after eight weeks of therapy, she was 95% back to normal um, half, after having suffered for, for three years. And so these stories are, are just almost daily um, during our telemed of, um, uh, of patients getting better. And the reason is we're treating the underlying cause and we're not treating so anyway, these macrophages uh, bind to the blood vessels. Well, um, and let me just be clear for those listening, because a lot of people think the virus is still around. The virus is long gone, correct? This is not about the virus retaining its fragments and then this activation of the immune system. Is that right? Well, that's been debated. Yeah. Okay. And um, it's an RNA virus. You don't expect it to hang around for a long time. It doesn't have the um, latency machinery that the chronic herpes family viruses have. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and we were the only ones who've done um, whole genome sequencing of the entire SARS-CoV-2 genome. We did that in the uh, uh, non-classical monocytes when we published that two years ago. And then we looked into tissues of long COVID patients before all this reinfections going on. Um, and we found fragments just like we found in you know, in the monocytes macrophages, uh, and those fragments represented less than 5% of the genome. Mm -hmm. And my point is, you know what, um, you can't build a building with 5% of the bricks. Mm -hmm. So, and, and all the techniques that they're using to say, oh, there's, you know, viral persistence of tissue, which I believe. Yeah. There's, we, we published it, you know, there was a viral, there's persistence of fragments of RNA and persistence of uh, protein S1 in the non-classical monocytes. But at, but at the end of the day, they're all using techniques like droplet digital PCR, very short fragments, insight to hybridization, short fragments. You know, they're not doing whole genome sequencing when they're, and, and it's a big stretch. And I keep saying this over and over again. We can talk about persistence. I love talking about persistence, but it's persistence of fragments or as Jez Menninger said, um, viral debris. I love that. Um, but um, the fact is, uh, there's a huge difference between persistence and replication competence. Yes. Okay. And it makes sense to me, like even on a microbiome level, we know the fragments like LPS cause a massive immune response, right? So we can have fragments of viral particles that cause immune response, which is very different from the virus continuing to replicate. And, and you know what? The, the Paxlovid trial Mm -hmm. um, you know, failed at, you know, at several universities for long COVID. And the reason is there just isn't any viral replication, except the caveat is, and we published this in 2021, that we found viral replication out to 87 days in uh, one long COVID patient who had very low CD8 counts. Got it. So, so yeah, there at, means at three months, mm -hmm. you know, which is the cutoff for long COVID. Right. So, I, I, I'll always admit, you know, if, if you're at three months or four months uh, of long COVID, yeah, there could be viral replication. But when you're talking six years or months, <laughs> yeah, three years, um, 
there you're not going to see it. I'm still waiting for that paper that says whole genome sequencing reveals alpha variant RNA uh, in long COVID patient three years after infection. I haven't seen it and it's not coming. Well, that makes sense because we're, again, I've been doing 20 years of the chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, the long Lyme, all those things before COVID. And we've been seeing these immune dysfunction activations. And the same question has been in the Lyme community. Yes, we know these spirochetes persist, but is it truly that infection or is it the immune response that's creating inflammation? I agree. I think more and more we're determining it's actually this long immune response, a dysfunctional and weakened immune system um, that's more likely to be part of the culprit than just purely the infection. Absolutely. And I brought that question the Lyme community, you know, it's, um, you know, there's, there's articles showing, you know, the peptidoglyc cell wall peptidoglycan and, you know, in you know, arthritic joints from patients with Lyme arthritis. I'm like, those are just setups for phagocytosis by uh, monocyte macrophage lineage cells and persistent presentation to, to the immune system, you know, and, and that would be another mechanism for, you know, post-treatment Lyme disease, chronic Lyme disease, whatever you want to um, call it, where, you know, your refractory antibiotics, yes. that's where we come into play because we found the um, the blood vessel inflammation in, in chronic Lyme. So, yes, so that's where, and you kind of alluded to, but I want to be really clear for those listening. So first of all, you're seeing, you can actually determine through the long haul index, the uh, high like the likelihood and what's the percentage is of like sensitivity and specificity of how accurate that test is. And this is the long haul panel, the cytokine 14 panel through your lab. Um, right. Tell us a little bit about that and the specific cytokines and patterns. So, you know, so like I said, machine learning and uh, AI brought our 158 panel down to 14. We're now using that on all of our machine learning for various different um, uh, immune conditions. And now we're getting a little bit into some of the autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's and, and others. But what it basically shows, when I look at a panel, I look at several things. Number one, I look for that SCD40L, CCL5, VEGF pattern of vascular inflammation. And undoubtedly, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to find it. And there's different severities. And maybe they just have SCD40L, like you said at the beginning. Um, or you know, maybe there's a, few, a little bit of lingering VEGF. Um, that's the first thing I look for. The second thing I look for is the long hauler index. And so if, it, you know, if it's in you know, normal range or is it elevated, um, and how elevated is really important based on our new algorithms. So when I start searching for line patterns, yeah. the, my three bullet points are inter elevated interleukin eight plus elevated interferon gamma, elevated interleukin 13 plus elevated, uh, interferon gamma or a long hauler index greater than six. Wow. Okay, so that makes sense. Point one six, um, it's probably long COVID. If it's really high, um, I'm I'm sending it off for, for line testing. So, so I'm just having this aha listening to you because I've been treating Bartonella with BC of Borrelia forever. And what I know about Bartonella in particular is I'll use VEGF as a marker of activity. And I haven't, because I haven't had access to your panel for that long, been regularly using the other vascular markers and some of the new stuff you just mentioned. But it makes sense because Bartonella in particular is, is a vasculitis kind of a, like it, it causes more vasculitis than any others. And again, I only knew about the VEGF, but this is making so much sense because what I was starting to see was my own little tiny one marker indicator of vasculitis, right? Which is right. what you're seeing in different ways with covid um, but you're able to now with machine learning and looking at these cy cytokine panels to put out this, we have the symptoms buckets. It's the same for Lyme and long COVID and, and chronic fatigue. Right. And you're basically okay. saying now we can actually look at cytokine patterns and say, which is which. Exactly. And uh, the latest, and this is coming out in a new paper, which I should be sending off uh, to a preprint server um, uh, after the holidays, but uh, we have a new Lyme index, much like the long hauler index. And the Lyme uh, uh, index, interestingly, uh, in the numerator is um, TNF alpha and interleukin. Well, well, TNF alpha, which we published in February in 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 our uh, outcome study with treating long COVID patients, uh, TNF alpha and interleukin two are the major drivers of fatigue. Ah. 
course. So now you can start to correlate which cytokines are actually representation representation of those symptom clusters, right? Like migraines, this versus fatigue versus the brain fog. Uh, fascinating. And and you came out for a second, but did you say IL-2 and TNF-alpha are the two that are most correlated with fatigue? Yeah, it's in our February paper in uh, Frontiers in Medicine. But the most, I you know, that was a 20-patient study, Moravarock and statins and long COVID. Um, we did five different symptom scores, fatigue, dysautonomia, neuro, cardiac, and uh, shortness of breath or dyspnea. And, you know, um, and then we looked at our entire panel uh, and looked at those biomarkers and, and how they would respond to six to 12 weeks of Moravrock and statins. What we didn't, ex we expected, you know, the fatigue score to go down and, and maybe even dysautonomia because we see correction of those symptoms. All five symptom scores went down with statistical significance. But most importantly is we didn't stop there. Yeah. We told our stat biostatisticians to then correlate what symptoms um, correlated with reductions in what biomarkers. So we closed that loop of infection, inflammation, symptoms, treatment. Wow. Infection inflammation, symptoms, treatment. And that that circle, you know, I have not seen close for any other marker in any of these chronic diseases where you say, oh, there's, you know, all this, especially early on in long COVID, oh, there's this autoantibody and that autoantibody. And my first question was, okay, what symptom does it cause? Yeah. Right? Right. And if you bring that autoantibody down with IVIG, for instance, does it, does the symptoms get better? no one closed that circle. And I, it was really important for us to close that circle between biomarker, symptom, and treatment of the with a very targeted approach uh, with our two drugs um, at the actual um, proteins that are causing the symptoms, not the symptoms. Right. So, you know, for instance, here's a great example. This new paper that comes out, serotonin, and we did this clinical study. Long COVID patients are responding to Prozac because um, it elevates serotonin. Um, you know what? You know what the most important thing uh, that lowers serotonin levels are? Chronic inflammation. And you know what? Um, cytokines lower serotonin levels? Interleukin-1 mm -hmm. beta and TNF-alpha. Yes. And we've seen in IL-6 too, all the studies on depression, IL-6, right? I don't know that that correlates with serotonin, but depression absolutely in the studies correlate with IL-6. Glad you mentioned that because from a mental health aspect, you know, in our 40,000 plus patients, I mean, the amount of anxiety and depression is, uh, is incredible. Yes. And, yeah. you know, their physicians want to throw them on this and that, this, this, this drug, that drug, but at the end of the day, when you resolve the inflammation, it goes away. Yeah. I mean, I've been known to say, I think all depression anxiety is non is, is, is organic in nature in the sense that there's some other cause of it. Now I shouldn't say all, cause there's always exceptions on genetics okay. and stuff. Right. But I feel like more and more and more toxic load, infectious burden, cytokine, immune inflammation is really at the root. I would say 80% of my clinical mood disorders and, um, you know, any sort of psychiatric diagnosis frequently, if we get to that root cause, it's a game changer. And, and, and it's amazing because we're starting to see, you know, I, I just read a paper the other day about dysautonomia and Lyme, you know, it's like all of a sudden long COVID, uh, we opened this Pandora's box for these chronic inflammatory uh, conditions. And you know what? There was differences that allowed us to um, model that. Yeah. But you know what? There's also a lot of similarities, and and you see anxiety and depression in in chronic Lyme. You see, I, and so all of this stuff is starting to come together under this rubric of you know uh, an altered immune system and and chronic inflammation. And here's another example: pans pandas. You know, I I probably have somewhere around fifty pans pandas patients, and you know what? The classic was. Let's immunosuppress them and then give them IVIG. Well, you know what? The problem is um, it's it's post-infectious. Yes. And you don't yes. know if the infection's cleared. Right. So 
you know what they always say pans pandas is is from strep and recurrent strep well you know what i i have a handful of pans pandas patients that all have a chronic herpes family virus that when it reactivates the ticks the symptoms everything gets worse yeah. when you suppress the chronic herpes family viruses it gets better yeah. but the other yeah. thing we found in pans pandas and the reason why i think there was it was hit or miss for IVIG treatment was that there's a chronic inflammatory component that nobody had ever identified before. And so just taking away autoantibodies wasn't doing it. And it wasn't doing it because there's also pretty significant chronic inflammation. But when you treat the chronic inflammation, for instance, with Maravroc and statins, and then you do IVIG at the same time, these kids are really responding. So I, I love that because I think even we talk about IVIG, I have a lot of patients that are on that. They do well, but here's the deal. We think it's just that immune system, but the truth is it actually has a very potent anti-inflammatory mechanism as well. Same with the statin. It's, a, it's kind of an equivalent. We're thinking about this cholesterol issue. That's really the side note, right? It's really this anti-inflammatory. And maybe you could talk briefly because you, you alluded to this, but statins, your mechanism of action is much more directed to the endothelium. What is, the, what is it that it blocks exactly? You mentioned it earlier with the statin. Protein um, called fractal chitin. It's made by endothelial cells, and believe it or not, these pro-inflammatory non-classical monocytes have a fractal chitin receptor. Okay. And okay. so, um, to keep them from binding to the blood vessels and causing inflammation, let's downregulate statin. Uh, downregulate fractal chitin. Well, statins downregulate fractal chitin. Yes. Okay. And, and we don't use cholesterol lowering, you know, uh, doses of, of statin. Right. Yeah. You well, use like 10 or 20, like real, quite low I, doses, right? I miss that. You know, I'm like, no, we're not giving you, you know, massive doses of um, statins for the rest of your life. It's six to 12 weeks yep. with a quarter of the dose yep. that you would give for cholesterol lowering. And it's just an exquisite um, anti-vascular inflammation uh, agent. So great combination we're making it into a single pill perfect um, moravrock and uh, like i said our rct will which uh, statin did you choose for the trials we chose uh, a atorvastatin and the reason was when um when i was treating kids with long covid uh they responded so well i mean i would say kids you, you always say six to 12 weeks people with more neuro symptoms maybe even longer than 12 weeks but kids, I mean, some is as little as four weeks wow. and they're better. They're completely better. And, you know, four to eight weeks is about the standard for kids because they probably don't have all, a lot of other co, uh, you know, comorbidities. But uh, I was using a torvastatin because there's studies published on the safety of a torvastatin in, in kids. Right. And nice. they're getting better faster. So then I decided to use a torvastatin uh, in adults. Mm. And wow. with the SCD forty L be the main marker of that fractal kinin activation? Is that or they is there any correlation with one of your cytokines with knowing that I, the fractal I wish we had fractal kinin. Right, right. That's what I'm wondering. Like how do we know for sure, even though we know the mecha like we can understand the yeah. mechanism and see that. Is it that triad that you mentioned before? Okay. So the S C D forty L, the VEGF, and the Rontes, the CCL five, those three. CCL five. Okay. Got it. And in that way, you know, if someone has high on those, it's very likely they have the fractal kinin, the atypical macrophages. And, and, and again, this, I suppose it could be another mechanism besides long COVID, but that mechanism is absolutely involved in most long COVID, right? Absolutely. And, um, and also involved in chronic Lyme and uh, MECFS and, okay. you know, um, and, and maybe many others. Mm -hmm. um, You've had some significant success with Sjogren's syndrome. Of, in the yes, I've been seeing that too. So let me take the jump here with, because I'm in this functional world and seeing the diagnoses and um, obviously POTS dysautonomia is at an all-time high for all of these underlying reasons. Is that because of the vascular um, inflammation? Is that usually the, the link to the POTS? Yep. When it happens when blood vessels are inflamed is they dilate. Okay. When they dilate. Your blood pressure goes down. When your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes up. I mean, it's just it's classic, you know, physiology. And then the other thing is these inflammatory cells. You know, uh, I, I've seen infiltrates of 
the inflammatory cells around, you know, the vagus nerve. So yes. Um, that and we're going be... after these vagal nerve stimulators, which is a nice idea, but I'm like, that's not going to fix the root cause, right? I mean, and and that's the thing, you know, there's so much out there on on these different what works, what you, but most of them are just are, are very transient, mm -hmm. you know, hyper, yes. um, you know, vagus nerve stimulation, um, you know, uh, there's this microclot stuff for a while, and I, I'm not really. Mm -hmm. uh, big 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 supporter of that because really the anticoagulants aren't, aren't working we tried plavix yeah. a year or two ago with all of our protocols and you know it just wasn't adding anything and and you know what microclots are are difficult to you know to look at when i see i've seen pictures of microclots and as a pathologist i said those look like uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition cells or EMTs. I don't even tell under a microscope, huh? <laughs> I, um, yeah, don't give me a microscope. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, these EMTs um, are formed when there's tissue damage, of course. Okay. There is an acute COVID. And oh, then that makes so much sense because really at the core, this is our immune system's damaging endothelium, and that's this whole cascade. And so, how do we go? And and the only reason the clot's happening is because it's repair. It's our mechanism, right? Trying to repair the damage to the endothelium. Um, so that yeah. makes so it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, but of course, in the absolutely. And so, and then these epithelial cells fuse with uh, macrophages and cause an EMT. And you know what they express? CCL5 uh -huh. um, and CCR5. And so then they migrate to areas of inflammation. So and are macrophages actually expressing VEGF or is that just a signal to get more blood flow? It, what actually, do you know so where? They actually express VEGF. And that's why when you talk about the tumor microenvironment and tumors yes, um, and the inflammatory infiltrates that come into the tumor microenvironment, I mean, you're talking about, you know, producing high levels of VEGF which, you know, uh, allows, you know, the, the tumors to, to uh, you know, increase their blood supply. Yeah. And, you know, it directly uh, decreases VEGF is Maraviroc. Uh, uh, so uh, all of this is just exquisite. And, you know, I, I think, you know, as I was sitting there in a hotel room in uh, China, I was really thinking about the cancer literature and our work in cancer and, and, and CCR5. Um, I mean, I initially started with some of the early trials of Maraviroc and Vicroviroc and others um, in the early 2000s for HIV. But then, uh, obviously, you know, we started uh, talking about this more exquisite role uh, in the immune system, basically as the quarterback, right? It's telling immune cells where to go, yes. when to go, and it can be both good and it can be bad. So, um, it's our job to exploit, you know, the good aspects of it. And the bottom line is it's not immunosuppressive. Yeah. We've been throwing us people on steroid genome yet again, another long COVID paper in nature with high cortisol. Well, you know what? Or no low cortisol. I'm yeah. like, cause everybody's on steroids. Yes. 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 First, steroids and LDN is like your, you know, it's the first, like, it's like a reflex. Here's yeah. your LD, here's your steroids, you know? And we're not really going to the root. Now, is there anything, obviously, in my world, I love to, if I could use curcumin or uh, lumbrokinase or any of these things, is there anything that you've seen that has any effect even remotely close to the medications that you've been seeing success with that's on the realm of natural agents? You know, I, I, it's a good question. I mean, because um, patients come in with lists uh, yes. of those agents. And I mean, my first question is, how's that going? Um, right. And then my, but you know what, the, all kidding aside, I mean, we've looked at some of these agents with our panel. I mean, we actually, we have a non-subjective means uh -huh. to test anything and everything for its, um, its, its anti-inflammatory activity that would contribute to, um, you know, improvement in, in the pathology. So, you know, it's really hard to say. Uh, I typically tell patients, you know, don't stop. Mm -hmm. You don't have to stop. Um, I don't, you know, I, it's neither here nor there. Um, but I mean, obviously the only one I talk about is turmeric because uh, turmeric for some reason increases um, uh, blood levels of Maraviroc. So, okay. Oh, interesting. So that's kind of just a nice synergistic effect with that makes wonderful sense.
Um, one other question that I know people are thinking, because we talk about mast cell activation and that's obviously connected, is this because we get cytokine activation, mast cells are part of our immune system and they're becoming activated and prostaglandins and histamine are part of this. Can you correlate, like, how does that fit in at all, if if anything, um, with the whole get, idea of mast cell activation? Having been in long COVID for so long and some of the early theories, you know, mast cell activation was one of them. And People took various agents and you know what, they, they really weren't that effective H1H yeah. block and that, you know, uh, and you know what, to me, um, if there was really a lot of mass cell activation, I'd see elevated interleukin 13, in everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. so, um, you, and you, you know, did say just with a lot of, with long Lyme, that was one of the patterns with, was it IFN gamma and, uh, interleukin. Yeah. 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 With, yeah. Okay. So maybe in that particular subset, there's more mast cells versus not um, fascinating. Um, well, what is the future? I mean, you you and your lab are doing some incredible work. This is just game changer for those of us out in the field actually practicing medicine. Um, what do you see as the future? What things are going to be coming out? Um, what's next? So we've had so much good news, um, especially in this last um, last quarter of the year. Number one, um, we're seeing uh, really broad um, reimbursement. Ah, good. good. Um, and um, that makes us uh, extremely happy because now, you know, it's not just a long COVID test. Originally, we were coding it as long COVID, but the fact is now we have the new algorithms to detect chronic Lyme and uh, have suggestions of MECFS. I presented this meeting about a month ago that there may be five different immunotypes based on uh, cytokine profiles that we discovered um, for MECFS, there may be five flavors at a minimum immunologically. I mean, we all know that it's very heterogeneous. We don't really know what the um, underlying cause is, but um, we're, we're starting to map that out uh, at a, uh, on an immune, cell, uh, immune profile level so that we can use targeted therapy in MECFS that is independent mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, bacteria or whatever that could be causing it. That's exciting because I think sometimes the toxic load, infectious burden, which I'm dealing with on this level, it's so hard to determine exactly what. But if we can go straight to the immune system and say this is what's happening, and then we know what to target, it it almost it does matter, but it almost doesn't matter what the original cause was, right? I, I tell that. To people um, frequently, you know, at the end of the day, you know, my initial thoughts are, I don't care yeah. what's causing this yeah. because it's the immune abnormalities that are causing you symptoms yes. and I'm going to yeah. take care of those. So, so yeah, so coming at the end of the year reimbursement for the test, which is uh, very, very exciting. The fact that, you know, we now have these patterns, which, you know, separate and define long COVID, um, Lyme, uh, MECFS, even fibromyalgia, uh, is all very exciting so that we can, uh, really treat them because they are treated differently. Um, and then most importantly, uh, great work by, uh, my team at Incel DX and, um, in getting our, uh, trial design for Maravroc and statins and long COVID, uh, all that written up, all of that, all the additional information. All of it's been submitted to the FDA, and uh, we're really excited uh, that 2024 will um, get our trial underway and and get this um, uh, hopefully uh, at some point get an approval. Um, the good news is they're already approved drugs, so you know it's um, you know it's a different pathway uh, where we're really looking at um, efficacy as a major um, major focus. So. Um, it's uh it's going to be an exciting year, but it's all been um, springboarded by the use of this diagnostic in chronic inflammation, and um, it's it's really resulted in in great great patient outcomes, and that's the thing that gets me. I mean, I I've gotten letters and 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 um, calls and everything, but the most I mean, this one girl is twelve years old. Um, wrote me a letter on colored paper with um, colored pencils. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Patterson, for making me better. And you know what? You, you, you get one of those and you're like, okay, you know what? 
all that work that for me started in the late 80s yeah. in viruses uh, was all worth it. I love that. And that's just such a great way to end here because like truly that's what why you and I do what we do is like to see the patient's faces that you know, see a change in their health. And that's the reason I get up every day. And I know for you too, and it's a long road sometimes, but I just want to say, um, I've been in this world a long time in my little tiny window of functional medicine as an MD, but I see the value and that to me, this is not only this conversation, this podcast and all the work that you do is profound. Like this is a game changer. And if you're listening, you just listen to history being made and it's going to continue for you if you stay tuned to the studies that Bruce Patterson's work and uh, group is putting out. So I just want to say on behalf of all physicians out there like me, thank you truly, because this is the kind of game changer. These are kind of those pivotal moment, moments, like when the cell danger response came out, we understood that. And some of these things are always game changers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Where can people find your work, your information, the lab, give us some websites and places and resources that they can find you. And we'll list okay. these if you're listening or you're driving, we'll list them everywhere this podcast is showed. So www.covidlonghaulers with an S.com. Um, is the best place to get uh, a hold of us, me. Um, uh, it's been a, it's a functional website. You know, we have, we're about to launch a physician's link so they can order the test directly for their patients. And, um, and um, you know, uh, it's been, uh, that's where all our information, all our publications, talks, uh, et cetera, all reside there. And of course, if you search on um, um, YouTube, uh, with my name in uh, long COVID, you'll you'll find uh, probably just about everything we've ever talked about. Oh, so, anyway. well, thank you as always. Here we are. We're recording around the holidays, so thank you as always. Once again, here you are taking time right close to the holidays to share this great information. Um, truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your work. Thank you for your intelligence and your genius and curiosity. And um, I hope I can continue to support the work that you're doing. Thank you.